at a book called Spiritual Politics, written by Corinne McLaughlin and Gordon Davidson, a very important book written by people who are involved in the occult. They will explain to you what it's really all about. J.P. Morgan, the great banker, of course, was into astrology. He said his astrology told him how to make his investments to make all of his money. Henry Ford was involved in the occult. Andrew Carnegie was involved in the occult. And Colonel House, the man who was able to control Clemenceau in Orlando and Woodrow Wilson in FDR and be able to go in the room and talk to people uh, and, of course, convince them uh, to take up his ideas. The man who was so intent upon uh, having communism survive when others wanted to do away with it, uh, he was one of the leaders of the occult movement. And, of course, this is why he left a copy of the protocols for those in the future uh, to uncover. And so we begin to see these patterns uh, unfolding. Let me read again what Manley P. Hall said, because this is so important. When the Mason learns the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power. He has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. Uh, you can read the book, uh, the book of Revelation, uh, by Barbara Marks Hubbard. Uh, the original manuscript was actually uh, been, been somewhat altered. This book you can get at bookstores today. Uh, it tells about the coming horror that is going to occur in the mass extermination of people. Uh, this book was published by the Lawrence Rockefeller Fund for the Enhancement of the Humanities. But in the original text, which we have, uh, she says this. Now, this book is... Uh, is channeled to her, uh, and she readily admits that by what she calls the Christ light, but I believe is a demonic spirit. And she is rewriting the book of Revelation so you, if you are an occultist, can understand it. She quotes Revelation 6 8, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and the beasts of the earth. And then she goes on to say, out of the full spectrum of human personality, one-fourth is electing to transcend with all their heart, mind, and spirit. One-fourth, however, is resistant to election. They are undetracted by life ever-evolving. Their higher self is unable to penetrate the density of their mammalian senses. They can't be reached. They're defective seeds. Ladies and gentlemen, she's talking about you and me, those of us who worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we approach the quantum shift from creature human to co-creative human, the destructive one-fourth must be eliminated from the social body. Fortunately, you dearly beloveds are not responsible for this act. We are. We are in charge of God's selection process for planet Earth. He selects, we destroy, for we are the riders of the pale horse, death. Let's go on and just point out that this is a, a book written in about 1900 by Rudyard Kipling, and all of his books at that time had the swastika on the front. Remember, he wrote the eulogy to Cecil Rhodes. Of course, he himself was involved in the occult. That's an occult symbol. That's why Adolf Hitler used the swastika, because it was an occult symbol. Uh, of course, Harry Truman, who gave China and Eastern Europe to the communists, was a 33rd degree Mason. Winston Churchill, uh, who insisted on the invasion of Gallipoli and of North Africa to create the carnage that would justify a world government, was a Druid, entered the Druids in 1908, uh, was a third degree uh, Mason, and that's why he got along so well with FDR. Uh, Herbert, pardon me, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, who uh, was in office. Uh, it didn't really matter whether the Democrats or Republicans were there. He was always in office. He was a 33rd degree Mason. That's how you get ahead in government. Let me take you uh, to the material I gave you a little earlier uh, from the Lucius Trust. And you remember I showed you this page before. Uh, where they were talking about meditation, letting in the light. Well, now you can know what the light is. Light is Lucifer. Let's go down to uh, the second Roman numeral, alignment. We project a light of lighted energy towards the spiritual hierarchy of the planet and the planetary heart, the great ashram of Sanat Kamara. Who is Sanat Kamara? We'll just change the letters around. It's Satan, of course. I mean, they're so openly and so blatant about it, but most people don't understand. Where does communism fit in this whole scenario? Oh, well, uh, Reverend Richard Wormbrand uh, was a Protestant minister living in Romania. He was arrested, put in prison, and tortured for 14 years to break his faith. Many of the ministers who were with him, of course, eventually broke. Many of them died in prison. When he finally got out of prison, he, he couldn't understand why they didn't just put him in prison. Uh, why did they want to break his faith? And so he began to study Karl Marx. And, of course, what he found out that Karl Marx, contrary to everything you've ever been led to believe, was not an atheist. 
And Karl Marx did not believe in socialism and communism. He was a Satanist, and he realized that socialism would destroy Western Christian civilization, which he hated. And that's why he embraced it, as did Proudhon and Bakunin and all of the other leading socialists at that time. They weren't socialists. They embraced socialism to destroy America. Of course, here you'll see the emblem of the Trilateral Commission. You look very closely. You'll three, three sixes joined together by an upside-down broken cross the Trilateral Commission created by David Rockefeller and Zygmunt Brzezinski. We started our discussion today with a poem from James Russell Lowell. And I want to give you the full text of that because it really lays out what this battle is all about. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide. In that strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side, some new cause, some new messiah, offering each the bloom or bright. And the strife goes on forever, twixt the darkness and the light. Then to side with truth is noble, and to share her wretched crust, ere her cause brings fame and fortune, and is prosperous to be just. Then it is the brave man chooses, while the coward stands aside, until the multitudes make virtue of the faith they had denied. By the light of burning martyrs, Christ, thy bleeding feet we track, toiling up new calvaries ever with a cross that turns not back. Though the cause of evil prospers, yet his truth alone is strong, though her portion be the scaffold and upon the throne be wrong. But that scaffold sways the future, for in the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. And that's what it's all about. Martin Luther understood this, this battle when he wrote that great hymn that we used to sing in church. We don't sing it anymore. A mighty fortress is our God when he said, not, you know, for still our ancient foe doth seeth to worketh woe. His power and craft are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Yeah. And St. Paul understood it uh, in, in Ephesians uh, 6.11 when he wrote, uh, for um, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this earth, against spiritual wickedness in, in high places. And the devil understood it because on the Mount of Temptation, he said to Jesus Christ, uh, why, uh, you know, if you'll simply fall down and worship me, all of these kingdoms on earth can be yours. But unfortunately, the modern church doesn't understand it. And our ministers tell us, oh, you're not to be involved in anything. Why, Romans 13 will tell you uh, that if you oppose what's going on in the world today, uh, why, of course, you're opposing the will of God. 